Good evening. So as you heard, I'm a musicologist. And that's a fancy way of saying that it's my job to think about, talk about, and write about music. It's amazing, and I love it. But when I went to college, I had no idea it was the thing I could do. Literally no clue that musicology was a thing. But whenever I'd go to my piano lessons, I would always spend the first 15 minutes annoying my professor with questions. Who was this composer? Why is this music important today? Why do we play it like this instead of like that? After a couple of probably exhausting years, my teacher sat me down for a talk, and I remember it vividly. He said, you know, until now, I just thought you were killing time so I wouldn't know you didn't practice. But now I think you might really be interested in this stuff. So he told me what musicology was, and he suggested maybe I should go to graduate school for that instead of for piano, which now that I think about it is actually a little bit insulting. But luckily for me, he was absolutely right. So after college, I went off to graduate school for six years. Six years. And not that I thought about it pretty much every day during that time or anything, but six years is longer than people spend in business school and law school put together. <laughs> so why did it take so long? Because I had to become an expert. Here are a few of the things that I learned. How to compose a fugue in the style of the composer J.S. Bach. How to recognize drumming patterns in Afro-Cuban music. How to read and understand books of music philosophy in French and German. I studied the impact of cassette tapes on music culture in 1980s India, and the meanings of illustrations in 14th century music manuscripts. And I spent months searching archives for missing letters, unpublished manuscripts, and obscure newspaper articles. Experts are important. Every field from quantum physics to auto repair has experts, and that's a good thing because we need experts. Experts make the world a better place. But right now we're on the cusp of a future where experts don't matter, and we have to try to fix that. A startling number of people today either don't trust experts or are simply unaware of what experts are saying. Climate science happens to be one good example because we have a lot of good polling data on that. Recent data from the Pew Research Center indicates that among PhD holding members of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, 93% believe the Earth is warming as a result of human actions. 93%. That's pretty good. That's an A. That's an A minus, maybe, right? That's what we'd call a solid consensus. Now, the percentage of Americans who believe there's consensus on this topic is 27 percent. That's not good. That means there's a disconnect between what experts are saying and what non-experts are hearing. Now, climate change is just one example. We can find something similar in almost every field from medicine to economics to literary criticism. There are a lot of reasons why faith in experts seems to be eroding. We can blame the media, the educational system, social media bubbles, opportunistic politicians, and more. But I think as experts and experts in training, we have to be willing to take part of that blame on ourselves, too. Because we often do a terrible job of communicating about the same subjects we're so passionate about. I learned so many things while becoming an expert, but one thing I never was really taught was how to communicate with people who aren't also experts. And I'm not alone. In fact, not only are we not sure how, but a lot of experts seem unclear about whether we even should try to communicate across a broad spectrum of people. We often make the mistake of equating complexity of expression with complexity of thought. For me, somewhere in grad school, I started believing that to be successful, I had to make everything pretty much as complicated as it could be. I would literally write a paragraph and then go back and rewrite it to be less understandable 
How messed up is that? I wanted more jargony buzzwords, more references to trendy scholars, more words and phrases that no one would actually ever use in conversation like these. Be honest. Raise your hand if you've ever used one of these words in a paper. I knew it. Now that kind of communicating can sometimes help you be taken seriously among your expert peers. It's like a secret handshake that only the really cool kids know, with cool being highly subjective in this case. But somewhere in the course of learning to walk, talk, think, and write like an expert, we can lose track of the fact that in some contexts, that same language can be off-putting or alienating. Now, I want to be 100% clear. I am not advocating for dumbing down what it is that we do. I'm not even arguing against discipline-specific language. We just have to know when and how to use it. Believe me, I love a good debate about thorny issues that come up in my own research on video game music. So if anybody wants to talk with me after the talk about, let's say, deconstructing paradigms of ludonarrative dissonance, please feel free. But if I'm not advocating for dumbing down, what am I advocating for? I think we have to become better at what linguists call code switching. We have to understand how to change the way that we communicate based on who it is that we're talking to. Those of us who are educators need to teach those skills. And all of us need to work on developing and refining them constantly. It's not always easy. Take it from me. I've given talks in front of some of the leading figures in my field. And I've published hundreds of pages of scholarly books and articles. But communicating with non-experts, that's tough stuff. For the last few years, I've really dedicated myself to getting better at it. And it's taken me way outside my comfort zone. Sometimes I write articles for magazines or blogs instead of for academic journals. Or I give informal pre-concert talks before music concerts in my area, like the Fort Worth Opera or the Dallas Symphony. Earlier this week, for example, for the second time, I sat on stage in a packed concert hall and gave commentary for a program of video game music for the Dallas Winds, one of the world's leading wind bands. It's been terrifying. And you should do it, too because it's also been unbelievably rewarding. So how do we do that? There are so many different ways, and we each have to find our own path because we're all good at different things. But let me give you just three sort of simple tips to help you get started. First, edit, edit, edit. When you write something for a non-expert audience, it's going to take a lot of TLC, especially when you're used to writing term papers or academic articles. Every single sentence that I write, I say, does this help people understand this better? And does it help get them as passionate about this subject as I am? And if not, it gets cut, even if I think it's great. Two, ask for help. Ask everybody, and I mean everybody. I send things to my friends, to my colleagues, to my former teachers, basically anybody I can corner in a hallway or guilt trip with an email. Truth time. I'm a tenured professor, and I still send a lot of what I write to my mother so she can tell me if it makes sense to a non-musicologist. There is no shame in asking for other people's advice. Three, practice communicating every chance you get. When you run into a friend from high school and they ask you what you're up to, maybe don't just say, I'm working in a lab. Say, I'm working to develop new medical treatments or I'm researching new ways to clean up the water. Use that time to open up space for discussion. Talk with that old lady at church about how you're directing a play that deals with civil rights, or tell that friendly stranger on the bus all about your term paper on Bollywood films, or bond with your cousins at Thanksgiving about that great class you're taking on income inequality in Appalachia. It feels weird. It really, really does. It takes hard work, and it takes courage to communicate outside our comfort zones. But it's essential that we put in that effort and we learn how to do it. The world needs experts now more than ever before, and it needs you all to be those experts. It needs you to make breakthroughs in the labs and in the concert halls and in the classrooms. 
but it also needs you to be experts who can break through to other people. We have to do our best to engage with the many different types of people that are all around us, because only then can we help them see the value in the things that we're so passionate about. It's a tall order, I know, but you can do it. Trust me, I'm an expert. Thank you. <laughs>